Hey guys, welcome back to Hardware Unboxed. I'm your host Matt as always, and today I've got the privilege of an interview with Robert Halleck, and he is the Head of Global Technical Marketing at AMD. Thanks for making a long trip. Hey, thank you. Earlier this month, AMD shocked and impressed everyone with the 199 USD yeah. price tag and announcement of the RX 480. Um, what can you tell us about the other Polaris-based GPUs being released at uh, this time? Sure. There, there are two other Polaris-based GPUs. Of course, there's the RX 480 on top, but below that, there's the RX 470, which is based on the same chip as the 480. Yep. And then below that, there's the RX 460, which yep. is based on a chip we would call Polaris 11. Uh, the other two are based on Polaris 10, which is larger. How did AMD arrive at the RX Monica? And is that uh, a special meaning at all? Yeah, so when we had the R7 and R9, um, I think it was hard for gamers to identify. I'll even take a step back. When we originally conceived of R7 and R9, we kind of thought it would work like automobiles, where you'd have different categories of, of car. Yeah. And that works okay for automobiles, but maybe didn't work out so well for GPUs. <laughs> um, so this time, if it's a gaming card, if we've designed it for gaming, it will be RX 400 series. If it's not a gaming card, then it would be just 400 series. So Radeon 4 something. And, and so we think that this will be a simplification in the branding, make it easier for gamers, just everyday consumers who maybe don't track this stuff very closely to go, ah, this is for gaming, this one's not. Sure, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Uh, so why at this time has AMD chosen not to compete directly with the 1070 and 1080 cards from NVIDIA? Yeah, that's the big question, right? Um, if you look at the, the market, uh, there are you know, millions of GPUs shipped every year. And, and specifically the ones that people would buy off the shelf to integrate into a system. And 85% of all those GPUs are between $100 and $300. 85%. So while it's fun to talk about a, a very high-end GPU like the Radeon R9 3X or, or similar, you know, the, the reality is that's less than 20% of the market. And so for us as a company looking to grow our influence in the market, grow our market share, capture more users, the best way to do that is to, to make GPUs between one to 300 bucks. And that kind of led us directly to where Polaris is entering the market. So where did improvements in efficiency come from with the new Polaris cards? Yeah, so um, depending on what part you look at, it's, it's up to about 2.8 2.8 times the performance efficiency versus the types of products, uh, Radeon products that consumers would have today. And then um, per compute unit in our product, we've raised performance by about 15%. So there are many CUs inside a graphics card, uh, and each one now produces about 15% more versus what we've had. Um, all of that comes from a couple areas. The big one is the transition to 14 nanometer FinFET at Global Foundries. So every little transistor in the chip is now much smaller than it was on our previous gen 28 nanometer products. Yeah. Um, that's a big help. You know, the smaller you can make a transistor, the less it leaks electrons into the surrounding environment, and the more power efficient you are overall. Uh, but that only got us to about 1.7 of the 2.8. Okay. Um, so the other um, you know, 1.1 is AMD technologies in, in laying out the transistors better inside the chip, um, finding unique ways to account for, uh, you know, if you have a product that is, take the 480, you know, there's a range of ways that the 480 can behave from the, the best version to the worst version. And um, normally we would have to build in margin to those products to, to ensure that all the products are consistent. But through our physical design optimizations, we've been able to significantly shrink that margin uh, part to part to part. And that allows us to get higher clock speeds, lower voltage, and lower power usage overall. And that's how we got to the 2.8 number, by being smarter about the way the chip was designed. So I keep hearing about this HDR thing. Yeah. Um, First of all, what is it? I almost know nothing about it. Sure. And um, how will Polaris support it? Sure, so HDR is high dynamic range, and it's the idea that uh, we would try to create displays that are capable of recreating the full diversity of what the human eye can see. We see billions of colors. We see tons of steps of, of brightness between pure black and pure white. You know, there are 
24, some say 42 steps of brightness between pure black and pure white that the human eye can see. Um, and so how do we capture all of that, all of the, the, the majesty of the human eye on a display? Well, that's what HDR is for. We're trying to get from about 17 million colors today on a normal display to over a billion colors. Uh, it's still not close to what the human eye can do. That's only about 75% of human vision, but a billion is a lot better than 17 million. Uh, and that particularly improves gold, red, and cyan. Uh, and you know, brightly lit, really colorful games would be much more colorful and more accurately colored than they are today. Um, contrast is also a big one. Um, how do we make a darkly dimly lit scene in a game, there's lots of those, yep. look just as detailed as a daylit scene in a game. Well, if we can make the contrast contrast better, then this color gray versus that color gray could be a lot more distinct and a lot mm -hmm. more noticeable. And and so um, you know we can we can finally make these darkly uh, lit scenes look just as good as a daylight one. Um, and you put all of that all of that together, more colors, more contrast, brighter displays, more accurate displays, and that's HDR. And you know, if you're the kind of person who is really passionate about monitors, you know, it is the window into your experience of gaming, then HDR is far and away the, the best upgrade I've ever seen. You know, if you if you were the kind of person who says, I have to have an IPS monitor or I refuse to buy a TN monitor. You're the kind of guy who wants HDR. It's just breathtaking. So side by side with an yeah. enormous difference. Undeniable difference. Undeniable. Awesome. Yeah. Look forward to seeing it. Yeah. At one hundred and ninety nine dollars, what what kind of VR experience can users expect? Yeah. So our our goal was to take you know what is sort of three hundred fifty to five hundred bucks now. This uh, this validated HTC Vive or Oculus Rift sort of GPU and take that cost down to one ninety nine. Yeah. Right. So we're talking still 90 uh, FPS smoothness. We're talking no drop frames, no juddering. Talking you know the full diversity of the content available in those ecosystem. Now it's at a two hundred dollar graphics card instead of three fifty to five hundred. Yeah. That's the kind of experience we're talking about. Great. So the yeah. full experience for two hundred bucks. That's right. Will the other the lower cards in the four hundred series that you mentioned before be able to support VR and deliver? A you know, somewhat similar experience? Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, we sort of see the opportunity for different classes of VR experience. You know, in the same way that there are different classes of consoles out today. You had N Nintendo Wii, for example, which was a more simpler, uh, a more simple sort of graphics, and then you have something like the, the PlayStation 4, the Xbox One, which is a lot more advanced graphics, but nobody can say that any of those consoles aren't fun, yeah. right? And nobody can say that the people who play those aren't gamers, yeah. right? It's just different. And so we see an opportunity with a product like the, the Radeon RX 460 yeah. to run that, that less graphically demanding class of content, still at 90 frames per second, still buttery smooth, still no drop frames, and it's you know, when we can realize that collectively as an industry, you know, us with the hardware, HMDs, users, then that's, I think, a huge opportunity for the VR market to explode and, and take off. Great. Yeah. Exciting times. Um, are you expecting many upcoming DirectX 12 games to utilize async compute? Um, and if so, do you think this will give AMD's fourth generation GCN graphics cards an advantage over NVIDIA's? new generation of cards. Sure. Uh, it, well, it's worth defining asynchronous compute, right? Um, you know, historically, in graphics APIs like DirectX 11 or OpenGL, uh, on other graphics architectures, everything that the GPU would do from the time it's asked to, asked to render a picture to the time it comes out on the screen has to be done step by step by step. Um, so if you are asked to put a light on the screen, First, you have to ask it to put the light on the screen. Then you have to determine what that light is going to look like. And then you actually have to render it out. But a lot of that stuff could be done in parallel. Like the setup for one thing and the execution of another could all be done in parallel. And that's the idea of asynchronous compute. Um, multiple queues working together. Um, so it's a big performance boost for us. You know, we've seen gains up to 20 or 30% with this feature active. 
Um, so looking into the future, we're talking to uh, talking about games like Deus Ex, Human Re uh, Revolution. Yeah. I'm sorry, Mankind Divided. Um, uh, we're talking about Civilization VI, Battlefield One. You know, these are huge titles in in their respective space, and we're talking about asynchronous compute in all of them. It's a, I think, a really fundamentally powerful performance changing experience or technology for people. Sure. So I know a lot of people are going to be wondering, will these Polaris cards be supporting HDMI 2.0? Yep, we did uh, address that concern from the <laughs> Radeon R9 Fury X, and these products will support HDMI 2 and specifically HDMI 2.0B uh, for HDR support as well. Um, but that's kind of just one of many things that we've done to, yeah. to future-proof this product. We know that people want to build home theater PCs with 4K TVs, so yeah, we added HDMI 2.0B, but there's also a lot of higher resolution and higher refresh rate monitors coming that are going to use DisplayPort 1.3. That's in this product as well. Um, there, obviously game streaming or game recording is really, really popular. Um, if those services transition over to H.265 encoding to save bitrate, we have an H.265 encoder in hardware uh, for games and as streaming video services like Netflix and Amazon transition over to HDR we have an HDR ready decoder built into the chip so uh, there aren't really any standards or specifications looming on the horizon six months out or 12 months out that this card can't handle or won't be ready to be compatible with and I think that's really important for gamers in this particular one to three hundred dollar price band because they only upgrade every two to four years. Yeah. So having a full complement of kind of future ready technologies is going to be really important for people. Yeah. So they don't need to worry if they're buying at the right time. Exactly. All right. Beautiful. So I see the cooler is actually a lot longer than the board on this 480. Are they all going to be like this? Or? Yeah. Great question. So on the 480, 470, 460, we'll allow. Um, our board partners like Sapphire and Asus to actually make custom designs and they would be allowed to produce a cooler that's only as long as the PCB. Yeah. But on our reference design we have sort of a, a different challenge. Um, you know, we sell a lot of these cards into OEMs like HP and Dell and and they exclusively want blower designs, right? So they have to be longer. So our reference design has a blower, but AIBs will be able to fully customize the ports as well. Excellent. Yeah. Is there a 2560 stream processor Polaris 10 part coming, or uh, is the 480 already using the full silicon? The the 480, the shader configuration is the full configuration of the yeah. Polaris 10 chip. Okay, yeah. sure. No worries, that was easy. Mm -hmm. um, little question, what do we call the new GCN, is it GCN 1.3, 1.4, yeah, 4.0? So that's, that's a fun backstory. So uh, all credit to Anantech in North America for coming up with the, the numbering scheme that yeah. everybody now uses. But in, internally at AMD, we've, we've never had really uh, an internal numbering scheme to, to address you know, one GCN versus another. Uh, we've always talked about it in terms of actual code names. Like Tihi, which most users would know as the 7970, yeah. was GCN 1.0. And then we went to Bonaire, which is the Radeon 7790 or the R7260, that was 1.1. And then products like Fiji, um, better known as the Fury X, or Tonga, the 285, those would be GCN 1.2. And yeah. finally, here we are today with Polaris. Um, since we had no official names previously, and we know people really want one, it's <laughs> yeah. easy to talk about, mm -hmm. uh, we're calling this the fourth gen of, of Graphics Core Next. Right. So you can kind of work backwards from there and figure out what the other generations are. But sure. Finally, unofficial name. <laughs> That's what a name is going to call it. I, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Uh, last one. So will the Polaris GPUs uh, utilize any sort of boost clock type feature? Yep, absolutely. Uh, products on the shelf will have a, a base clock and a boost clock, and yeah. uh, people will see that at retail. Right, excellent. Well, we'll look forward to finding out what kind of frequencies yeah. are we running at. Shortly. Alright. Well, thanks a lot, Robert, for making the long, long trip to <laughs> yes, join me here right. in Melbourne, Australia. Um, for my viewers, we're going to be giving away one of these RX 480s, so stay tuned for that and for more GPU content. Thanks a lot. Hey, thank you.